Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today, you won't believe what I have in store for you. Today is gonna be the first of the history bits. <laughs> Oh no, we thought he was never gonna do it because he, a, a year ago, he said he was gonna do these. And I haven't. But I'm, I sat down and I'm gonna, I'm gonna freaking do it. So, guys, uh, before we start, just understand that this is a broad survey of Greek history and not meant to be a grad school course. So keep that in mind before you yeah, go down and yeah, you, didn't you realize that on the third day of the fourth month? Uh, like, it's okay. <laughs> it's really okay. Second, my pronunciation of Greek stuff may be off. This is one, because I am a Latin teacher, and so I, I tend to pronounce things the way that Latin is pronounced. So the A-E's, I'm gonna say I, because that's how it's pronounced in Latin. So when we talk about the Eupatridae family in Greece, the Alcmyonids, I'm gonna say the Alcmyonids instead of the Alcmyonids. I, I know, like I know that it's Alcmyon. I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say Alcmyonid. That's okay, guys. Basically every Roman history video I've ever watched doesn't pronounce crap correctly. So if I can deal with people not pronouncing quaestor, quaestor, but instead queester, quester, etc., you can be okay with this. And sometimes I just use whatever Romanized pronunciation I want to do. That's okay. If the pronunciation is, is, is bothering you, then I wasn't very interesting anyway. Third, in this particular one, I'm going to introduce the sources that I use. I'll have all of those down in the description always. But this is mainly going to follow the, the chronology of Anthony Everett's Rise of Athens, but will also be supplemented with other Greek history books, like Ancient Greece from Prehistory to Hellenic Times by Thomas R. Martin, Ancient Greece, Everyday Life and the Birthplace of Western Civilization by Robert Garland, The Penguin Historical Atlas of Ancient Greece by Robert Morcott, Handbook to Life in Ancient Greece by Adkins and Atkins, I love this one, A History of Greece by Burry and Miggs, and then, of course, the primary sources, Herodotus, Thucydides, and then as we get further into the Peloponnesian War, the Xenophons, um, both his Hellenica and his Anabasis. So that'll always be linked down there. So I, I'm not going to say them all the time. I'll just tell you if you want to hear me say them to go back to the first video. So guys, without wasting any more time, if we listen to each other, let's talk about ancient Greece. So I am going to end up skipping ahead. I'm not going to talk about really the pre-Hellenic times much past the Trojan War. I might later go back and talk about the Mycenaean Age and, you know, the fall of the Bronze Age and all of that stuff. But that's not going to be, not going to be now. My interest doesn't really come until, until the Hellenic Age. So that's just where we're going to start. So if you're like, well, why didn't we talk about the Mycenaeans? Because I, I, at this point, don't care. But what we are going to talk about is today we're going to talk about Greek identity. So a lot of what we're going to talk about in the future has its roots, and the way these Greeks behave has its roots in the Trojan War. Sack of wine. Now, most of you probably know what the Trojan War is. It is a huge, like, it's like a world war, essentially, that took place circa 1200 BC, where the Greek city-states go, all of them, in the greatest overreaction in all of human history, the Greek city-states go to war with Troy, which is a city across the Aegean in Asia Minor, what is today's Turkey. I'll throw, I'll throw maps up periodically when I say places, so just be, be on the lookout for maps galore. And they go to war over a woman named Helen. Now, that ha that traces its roots back to the wedding of Theus, the sea nymph, uh, and and Peleus, a Greek warrior. These are the parents of the Greek hero Achilles. Jack of wines. At their wedding, the goddess of discord, Eris, was not invited, because why would you invite the goddess of discord to a wedding? But that's one of those things where you're screwed if you do and you're screwed if you don't. Because if you don't invite her, she's just going to sow discord. And if you did invite her, she was probably going to sow discord anyway. So she bowls a freaking golden apple into the middle of the, uh, the proceedings that says to the fairest on it. And all of the poof, 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 the gods plus Apollo probably all fight over and over because Apollo, you know, thinks he's the fairest probably. And so finally it comes down to uh, Hera and Athena and Aphrodite. They've decided that they're the three finalists, and they go to Zeus and say, Zeus, hey, Zeus, dad, slash nephew, slash 
brother slash husband, whatever all of that is. Which one of us is the fairest? Which one of us gets the apple? And Zeus is not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. So he says, no, 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 no. So he goes to a shepherd over on Mount Ida, who's actually a Trojan prince. And so he's like, yo, Paris, bro, you want to decide between these, these beautiful ladies who's the fairest? And Paris is like, yeah, totally. And so Paris has to decide. And so Hera goes first and is like, Paris, if you choose me, I will make you king of all of Europe and Asia. And you know, Paris is pretty cool that, like, king of Europe and Asia? Oh, heck yeah, that's awesome. But Athena's like, no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. Not so fast, not so fast. If you choose me, I'll give you wisdom and skill in war. And then you can just take over Asia and Europe. And then, who knows, the rest of the world after that. And he's like, oh, whoa, even more? That's, that's amazing. And finally, Aphrodite's like, oh my gosh, if you just choose me, I'll give you, like, the most beautiful woman in the whole entire world. And he's like, whoa, that's way better. Because, of course, he chooses the hot chick. And so Aphrodite ensorcels, and we're not going to debate whose fault the Trojan War is, but Aphrodite whisks Paris away over to Sparta, where he gets the most beautiful woman in the world, which is Helen. But Helen is already married. She is married to the Spartan king, Menelaus. Menelaus is not here. He is off at war because they're always off at war. And so they fall in love thanks to Aphrodite and Paris absconds with Helen all the way back to Troy. And Menelaus gets back, realizes that she is gone and that she is in Troy and the aforementioned overreaction occurs and he calls his brother do, 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 do. he calls his brother Agamemnon and is like get everybody every single Greek we're gonna go get my wife back and Agamemnon's like yeah sure Agamemnon loves fighting so they get all of the freaking Greek city-states to send hundreds of thousands of troops over to Troy to get Helen back. You, you might know that part and you definitely know how the Trojan War ends with Odysseus, the wiliest, the, the, the smartest, the cleverest of the Greeks. Uh, the Romans hate Odysseus. They call him wily Ulysses, crafty Ulysses because he's, he, he's tricky and the Romans don't like that. He constructs, of course, the Trojan horse, which they pull inside despite, according to Aeneas, him not thinking it was a good idea, and despite Laocoon being like, guys, it's, it's flipping hollow. Like, it's hollow. Listen. And he throws the spear, and then the snakes eat him, whatever. So the Trojan horse goes in, and all the Greeks, you know, they die, and Aeneas runs, whatever. The Trojans are victorious. So the most well-known account of the Trojan War is from the blind poet Homer in 762 BC. And let me go ahead, and you can zoom in right here. Listen. If you're already going down to the comments to be like, Homer didn't exist, so we have proven that Homer was not a real person. Let me ask you one question. Why do you hate people having joy and wonder and adventure about things? Do you just walk around listening to people's conversations, waiting so you can leap in and correct them? And do you find little children and tell them that things that they believe are real aren't real because you hate magic and fun? If that's you, okay, like, but keep it to yourself, all right? Homer exists for the purpose of anything that's interesting. So, end PSA. And so all of the Greek city-states could understand the Iliad because even though they all spoke different dialects of Greek, they had that kind of shared base of language. Because what you have to understand, and I'm going to say multiple times, is that Greece is not Greece as we know it. That was like in the 1800s or whatever when Greece fought for unification, independence, all that kind of stuff. Here, we're dealing with what are called nation states or poleis. And so the Iliad covers the Trojan War. And what I think a lot of people don't understand who haven't read the Iliad is that the Iliad, the, the, so the Trojan War lasted for 10 years. It was a 10 year war and then freaking Odysseus took 10 years to get home. But the Iliad actually covers less than two months worth of the ninth year of the war. The, the, the Trojan horse is not actually in the Iliad and neither is the death of Achilles. And the reason it's so narrowly focused is because the Iliad is about these personal contests and these personal duels of, of like bravery and honor that are just set kind of on a backdrop of this larger war. So yes, the Trojan War is happening around them, but that's just the setting for Achilles and Hector and Diomedes to just go out there and have their like individual uh, tests of combat, these one-on-one -on -one duels, battles of strength. 
So, as many of you may know, the central character of the Iliad is Achilles. Back of wine. He is Greece's best warrior. Um, he has rage issues, so he needs to touch some grass for sure. But he is invincible, except for his heel. Don't ask why his mom just didn't grab him by the other heel and dunk that one in too. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. His heel, he's, he can't be killed except for his heel. And the Iliad basically begins early on with Achilles having a fallout with the commander of the Greeks, the commander-in-chief of the Greeks, basically, uh, Agamemnon. Sack of wine. Who is the king of Mycenae. And they have a falling out over, of course, women's. So Agamemnon takes, as, as spoils of war, this 15-year-old girl named Chryseis, who is a, the daughter of a priest of Apollo. And the priest comes and it begs Agamemnon to give her back, and Agamemnon is not going to do it. And so he goes and prays to Apollo, the priest does, and Apollo gets ticked off and sends a plague on the Greeks, and all the Greeks are dying, like they're just dying left and right because of a freaking plague, and the Trojans don't have to do anything because they're just dying of plague. And so all of the Greeks, the Greeks form an assembly, and they tell Agamemnon, hey, so you got to give that girl back because we're all dying. We're not going to die because you want to keep this, this hot girl that you think you need to keep. So you can go ahead and give her back or else we're about we're gonna mutiny, so you need to get it done. And so Agamemnon understands that he has to do that. And so he gives her away, but is like, okay guys, well if I, I'm I'm the commander in chief, I can't give up my side piece if I'm not gonna get one in return. So which one of y'all is gonna give up your kidnapped Trojan woman? because I'm not going to give up mine and not get a replacement. And just really quickly, if you don't know who Apollo is, Apollo is the Greek god of... He's like... Uh, Apollo is like the liberal arts uh, god who gets the... Hum he's like the humanities degree of gods. He's the god of uh, sun and light and music and poetry and uh, healing and, and prophecy. He, he's, he's a god of a whole bunch of things. And so Achilles stands up to Agamemnon. Sack of wine. He's like, dude, you can't like take people's spoils of spoils of war away from them. And Agamemnon's like, oh, thanks for standing up and volunteering. I guess I'll take your spoil of war, which is a girl named Briseis that Achilles has had for a while, and he loves her even though she's, I mean, she's his property. So he takes Briseis, and Achilles can't refuse because Agamemnon is the commander of the Greeks. And so rather than kill Agamemnon, though he wants to, Athena appears and tells him not to, Achilles pitches a fit, and goes into his tent, sack of wine, curls up with a stuffy, and refuses to fight. He says, guess what? I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to fight for Agamemnon anymore. I don't care if the Trojans literally kill everybody. I'm still not going to fight. In fact, Achilles is so petty that he prays to Zeus that all the Greeks will be murdered, that every one of the Greeks dies as, as punishment for Agamemnon, you know, taking his, taking his woman. So, the Trojans now use this as an excuse to start actually winning the freaking war. Uh, they are led by Hector, who is uh, Troy's best warrior. He is the oldest son of the king of Troy, Priam, and they start winning. They start just massacring the Greeks because Achilles, who is their chief barrier to all being killed, and Hector, Hector, Hector and the rest of the Trojans just start massacring the Greeks. They fight all the way down to where the Greek ships are are. are parked, and all because Achilles refuses to fight. And Odysseus, Phoenix, a, a couple others, they, they go to Achilles and like, dude, you, like, you, like, will you please come out and do something? We are losing. I don't care. And Achilles is like, no, nah! no, nah! he's not going to do it. So finally, Achilles' best friend, Patroclus. Patroclus had grown up with Achilles. Um, he's slightly older than Achilles, and he's supposed to be like the tempering force with Achilles. And Patroclus goes in and says, look, dude, like everyone is dying. Um, everyone's friggin' wounded, Odysseus is wounded, Agamemnon's wounded, we got one doctor and he's wounded. If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna go out there, then at least give me your armor. Like, I'll put on the armor, I'll go out there, they'll think I'm you, and, and then all the Trojans will pee their pants. Because every time you're out there, they go, ah! And they, you know, run back because they are afraid of you murdering them. So let me put on the armor, and they'll run away because they'll think you're back. And Achilles is like, that's a, that's, a, that's a good idea, yeah, you do it. And so Patroclus promises Achilles he's not going to fight too far, and he puts on Achilles' armor, and, he, and, and, and it works. The Trojans are like, ah, Achilles! And so they run, and Patroclus just starts wrecking stuff. And, you know, he's, he's like getting super into it. He's like, yeah, look at me. Like, he's, he, he forgets that he is not, in fact, Achilles. And so the Greeks start winning, and, but Patroclus pushes way too close to the walls. He is, uh, uh, Apollo appears and just knocks the armor off him, and he's standing there, and he got, doesn't have any armor, and then one of the Trojans just stabs him, and then Hector sees him, and Hector finishes him off, kills him, 
And it's like, oh, this is not, his armor's awesome. And so he puts on Achilles' armor for himself. Rip Patroclus. I'm always going to give people who deserve, like, people that die, we're always going to give them a rip. So rip Patroclus. Plenty of ditches along the road. Maybe I'll find one to die in. So Achilles hears that his best friend is dead, and this man turns on the waterwork. <laughs> He screams to wake the dead. He cries a ton. That's important. Like, he just bawls. Because we wouldn't think, like, oh, I'm a tough warrior crying. No. Dude just, <laughs> Patroclus. So he makes up with Agamemnon, and he's like, guess what? I'm going to murder every single one of these Trojans, and I'm especially going to murder Hector. So I'm coming for you. Sack of wine. So Achilles has his mom get Hephaestus to make new armor for him, and he goes out there and he just starts carving a swath all the way through the Trojans. Most of them run inside the walls. Hector stays out there alone, gets afraid, runs from Achilles, tries to escape back in, but Achilles is known, one of his epithets is the swift racer. And so Achilles chases Hector three times around the entire city before they, he finally catches them. They throw spears at each other. Hector charges. Achilles knows where the weakness in his own armor, which Hector is wearing, and just stabs him in the throat and kills him. Rip Hector. But Achilles is not done yet. No, no, no. Now he takes straps of rawhide and, like, stabs holes in Hector's heels and, you know, ties little knots and attaches Hector's body to his chariot. And then Achilles jumps on the chariot and whips it around and... For 10 days, he just... For 10 days. I don't know if he stops to eat. I don't know if he stops to use the bathroom. I don't know if he just, like, for 10 days does, it, does nothing but pulls Hector's body around the city of Troy. Now, Zeus doesn't want the body destroyed, so it's, it's still not messed up, even though it's been dragged for 10 freaking days. Finally... King Priam ends up going in the middle of the night to Achilles' camp to, to, to kind of ransom his son's body back. And they talk about, you know, they talk about Achilles' dad, who's way off uh, in Greece and is never going to see Achilles again because he knows he's going to die here in Troy. And they share a moment. Achilles lets uh, Priam take Hector, uh, take Hector back to Troy and is going to stop the fighting for, for 11 days while they mourn and bury and bury Hector. And so the Trojans do it, do exactly that. Um, and that's where the Iliad ends. The Iliads end with the line, and so they buried Hector, breaker of horses. And that's where it ends. And there's still so, there's still a lot left in that story that we get from other sources, Virgil and the Aeneid being one of them. So sometime after this, Achilles is shot in the heel by an arrow fired by Paris that Apollo guides to his heel. Dead Achilles rip. Odysseus invents the Trojan horse, as I said, and the mass genocide of the Trojans ensues. But this is after the Iliad. So guys, that is it for me for today. I'm going to stop this here before it gets too long. Now that we've talked about uh, the Trojan War, and you know kind of what happened in the Trojan War, just in case you didn't, this is kind of a preface leading into uh, the next video, which will be, what is the point? So you've told us about the Trojan War, Alan, but what's the point? Why should we care? Stay tuned next time. Guys, if I ever talk about anything and there's, and, uh, you know, I, I don't cover something in depth enough and you want to know more about something, this, this is especially going to be true with, like, Greek life, like, uh, things about what it was like to be a Greek that I will brush over, like, in favor of the history, like, oh, what was Greek weaving like? You can let me know and I can take, I can look into it, take a break and make a bonus video about that. Anyway, this was the first one. Not a ton of history in here, at least for us, though the Greeks would have thought it so. But I wanted to go ahead and get this started. I've actually filmed part two already, and that's why I'm splitting it, because otherwise this video is going to be like an hour long, and I don't really want to do that to start with. So you have the Trojan War. Next video, we'll talk about what the point was, and then we'll get right into the beginning of the 5th century uh, BC. We'll do a little before that first. But guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for, for watching. As always, information on my Patreon and Discord is down in the description, and I'll see you next time, guys.